Well, have you ever been sitting there watching the evening news and wondering what in the world is wrong with people? Hardly a day goes by without seeing images of people engaged in unthinkable acts of random violence resulting in death and destruction, stories of unprovoked assaults on unsuspecting people, drive-by shootings, beheadings, Looting and riots dominate the headlines. Add to that fake news, corrupt politicians, greedy corporations, moral decay, sexual perversion, and the overall lack of decency and civility in society. And it seems like the world has lost its mind and is spinning out of control. And yet, despite all evidence to the contrary, we are supposed to believe that people are basically good. Even those who commit the most unspeakable crimes. And because they're basically good, they're not responsible for their actions. We need to try to understand the root causes of their violent, destructive, antisocial behavior and fix it. So we pass more laws. We spend more money. We create better social programs. We provide more education. We reform the criminal justice system, and on and on it goes. And despite the good intentions and best efforts of the most brilliant psychologists, sociologists, scientists, and educators, things in our world seem to be going from bad to worse, and it's picking up speed. As Christians, of course, we know what the problem is, don't we? The problem is sin. And Paul describes this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, un unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You see, people are sinful by nature and by choice. All the evil we see in the world today is the result of sinful people deliberately doing sinful things. It's what they do. It's in their nature and it comes from the heart. But it hasn't always been that way. You see, there was a brief moment of time at the dawn of human history when people were not sinful. And the good news of the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, people can be redeemed and restored to that state of original righteousness. So this morning, we want to gain a better understanding of what sin is when and where it originated, and what can be done about it as we explore the bad news, good news doctrines of sin and salvation. Let's start with the bad news, because it's really bad news. In Genesis 2, right after the story of creation, God's intended, um, God's inferred covenant with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden was contingent upon one simple command, you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day you do, you will surely die. And in Genesis 3, we come to what is known as the fall of man. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and broke his covenant, the image of God in them was severely marred, and human nature became thoroughly corrupted and as a result, Adam and Eve suffered immediate, immediate spiritual death, which is separation and alienation from God, and then eventually physical death. Consequently, the entire human race inherited the undiminished guilt, corruption, condemnation, and death that resulted from that one original sin. Now, the fall of man began with Satan's strategic temptation of Eve in the garden in uh, Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5, and his tactic followed a, dis a discernible pattern. First, 
He exploited Eve's ignorance of God's word. In Genesis 3, 1, we read this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, is that what God said? In Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, we read this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, maybe I'm just nitpicking here, and maybe you think it's just a small thing, but Eve had her own version of what God said. She had the gist of it, we'll give her credit for that, but she misquoted God and what he said, and her ignorance of his word is what gave the tempter his opening. The next step in this process, he lied to her about what God had said. In verse four, it says, but the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. You see, he directly contradicted what God said, and Eve had no comeback because she wasn't quite sure. Then the third step is that he lied to her about God's motives and about her own identity. Verse 5 says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve, God is withholding something wonderful from you. You have the chance right here to be like God. Now, the irony in this lie is that Eve was already like God. Adam and Eve were created in God's image and likeness, and she was in possession of original righteousness. God had declared that she was very good, and that there was no room for improvement. But Satan deceived her by calling God's word into question, lying to her about what God had said, casting doubt on his goodness, and lying to her about her own identity. See, the perfect bait was dangled, and the weakness of human nature at that point was exploited. And at that moment, Eve took the bait, believed the lies, and acted independently of God. In verse 6, we read, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Eve responded first to the desires of the flesh. She saw that the tree was good for food, And she began to rationalize. Food is good. I need it. Then she succumbed to the desires of the eyes. The fruit was a delight to the eyes. And she rationalized, ooh, I want it. And finally, she gave in to the pride of life. She saw that it was desirable to make one wise. And she rationalized, I deserve it. Isn't it? interesting how we can rationalize any sin with just, I need it, I want it, I deserve it. It's always an act of the will to succumb to temptation. Now keep in mind, Adam and Eve still have a perfect human nature at this point. But the moment they reached out, took the fruit, and bit into it, there was no turning back. The consequences of that one act of disobedience were catastrophic for the human race. And acting as our federal head, representing all of his future descendants for the rest of time, Adam's original sin resulted in his unmitigated guilt and condemnation being passed on to the rest of us. It's universal, it's irreversible, it's inescapable, and it's without exception. 
In that single act of eating the forbidden fruit, Adam forfeited his original righteousness for original sin. He went from being very good to totally depraved. And Paul tells us what that looks like in Romans 3, verses 10 through 18 and verse 23. Paul says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Kind of sounds like the news, doesn't it? You see, this condition is what theologians call total depravity. Total depravity doesn't mean that people are as bad as they can possibly be all of the time. That would be absolute depravity. Total depravity means that people are as bad off as they could possibly be in relation to God, with no means at our disposal to redeem ourselves or to reclaim our original righteousness. St. Augustine says it this way, creation is good and sin is a corruption or distortion of that original goodness. And that once sin has occurred, there is no way to get rid of it other than by divine intervention. Now, the way this condition was passed on to us from Adam is what theologians call imputation. Very important word. Adam's sin and its consequences were imputed to you and me. It is a legal decree handed down by God as the promised result of Adam's original sin when he violated God's command. In addition to the imputation of the legal consequences for his, his disobedience, you and I also inherited Adam's totally depraved and corrupt human nature by virtue of just being born human. We were not just declared to be sinners, we actually became sinners by birth. This is what it means to be in Adam. Now, what some find a little confusing about this is that fallen sinful people are still capable of doing relatively good things. But the good they do, no matter how noble or sincere, is not good enough to reverse the consequences and the effects of the fall. No one can be good enough or sorry enough or religious enough to atone for their sin or to change the sinful nature they inherited from Adam. And why not? And how is it that good deeds can still be sinful? Well, the theologian John Frame in his Systematic Theology gives us a useful definition of what sin is. And it explains how good deeds can, uh, of, of sinful people still cannot save them. The first is that these good deeds are based on a false standard. They judge themselves by something other than God's law. They determine good and evil on their own terms. And if they're good enough, if they're a good person in their own estimation, they feel confident that heaven awaits them when they die because all good people go to heaven, right? The problem is, how do they know when the good that they do is good enough? The relative good they do is measured by their own standard and by comparing themselves to others, but their standard always falls short when compared to God's ultimate standard of perfect righteousness. The second thing that makes good work sinful is false goals. They are seeking to accomplish a goal without any regard for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. See, making large financial donations to charities or organizing relief efforts for victims of natural disasters, providing food and shelter for the homeless, these are all good things. And 
But the intended goal of these activities is not to bring glory to God or to advance his kingdom, but to feel good about themselves and to get the credit for being a real difference maker. The third aspect of this is false motives. They're based on something other than true faith and sacrificial love. Paul says in Romans 14, 23, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. It's a big category. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, in all fairness, these people may be entirely sincere in their efforts to help others or to make a meaningful contribution to society, but they also see to it that they are properly recognized for their good deeds and are given due credit so that they can take advantage of any future opportunities that may come their way as a result of their altruism. So even the noblest of deeds by sincere people can be sinful when they're based on false standards and achieve false goals and are compelled by false motives. See, sin is a condition that we are born with. It's not a natural characteristic of human nature as God created it. Just as darkness is the absence of light and death is the absence of life, sin is the absence of righteousness. God created Adam and Eve in his own image and declared them to be very good in a moral and ethical sense. They were perfectly holy and righteous in God's estimation. So sin is alien to humanity. It is the total corruption of every aspect of human nature that results in separation from God, unmitigated guilt, condemnation and death for which their man has no remedy nor means of escape. In Romans 7 and 8, Paul calls this the law of sin and of death, and it is ingrained in a hard heart that is deceitful and desperately wicked. You see, we have a heart problem, don't we? In Genesis 6-5, says the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his thoughts, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In Jeremiah 17, 9, a verse we're very familiar with, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18 and 19, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Where did this all come from? See, the, the origins of sin are historical. Romans 5, verse 12, Paul says this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. See, Adam and Eve were real people. They were historical figures. And what they did happened in history at a particular time and in a particular place. And nothing has been the same since. So it's important for us to think of this sinful condition as being the result of an actual historical event. And it's important because the remedy God provided for our salvation from sin is also the direct result of an actual historical event. The incarnation of the Son of God, the second Adam. And that brings us now to the good news. Romans 5.17, Paul says, for if because of one man's trespass, Adam's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more 
will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So what Paul is saying here is that through the imputation of Adam's sin, we were made sinners, which resulted in actual sinfulness. But in the same way, through the imputation of Christ's righteousness, we were made righteous, which results in real righteousness. You see, Jesus is the second Adam who was also tempted by the devil using the exact same strategy that brought down Adam and Eve in the garden. It began with an attack on Jesus' identity. If you are the son of God, is the way he started this temptation out, an immediate attack on his, his identity. And then he hit him with the desires of the flesh. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread after he'd been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. The desires of the eyes. I will give you all the kingdoms and the riches of the world if you just fall down and worship me. Then the pride of life. Cast yourself down and God will send his angels to catch you if you are the son of God. In each case, Jesus resisted and defeated the tempter because he was grounded in God's word. And because of his obedience to the Father, and because he lived a sinless life under the law of Moses, and because he was obedient to carrying out the Father's plan of salvation, which meant dying on the cross for our sins, Paul is able to say, for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And the proof and the guarantee of that is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now the good news of salvation is that as believers in Jesus Christ and by God's grace, we no longer identify as sinners in union with Adam because we are now righteous in union with Christ. Do you see yourself that way? God now calls you saints, not sinners. Is he wrong? See, the truth of the gospel compels us now to make two confessions. Two confessions. The first is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, that's repentance, turning away from our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from most of our unrighteousness. Is that what it says? All unrighteousness. Paul says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, this is the second confession. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So there's a turning away from sin and a turning to God in those, in those confessions. You see, we often think of salvation as something that God has done for us, which is true. He has done something wonderful for us. But we don't often think about salvation as being something that God has actually done to us. And there's a difference. You see, when we enter into this new covenant relationship with God through faith in Jesus, here is what he does for us, or does to us. In Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Friends, what he's describing is the miracle of regeneration. This is precisely what Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. This is what has to happen to us before we can enter or even see the kingdom of God. And it has to happen to us in this life. When we believe in Jesus and receive his free gift of salvation, a radical transformation takes place on a heart level. I mentioned earlier that all of Adam's sins, all of Adam's sin was imputed to us. But now all of our sin is imputed to Jesus. And he took those sins and he died on the cross to remove them from us. Our sins have been taken away. The effects of the fall are being reversed and our original righteousness is restored because the righteousness of Christ has now been imputed to us. 1 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Friends, that's now. You're a new creation now. We have gone from being in Adam to being in Christ. We have gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We have gone from death to eternal life. We have gone from being in the flesh to being in the spirit. We have gone from being children of wrath to children of God. We have gone from slavery to sin to freedom from sin. We have gone from being condemned to being forgiven. We've gone from having no righteousness of our own to having the righteousness of Christ. So why do I still struggle with sin? It's a good question, isn't it? You see, I've thought about this a lot, and I've come to realize that there are actually two struggles involved here. The first struggle is with temptation. Now, you have to understand, temptation is not sin. We feel bad about being tempted, but temptation is not sin. But that first struggle is with temptation. I need it. I want it. I deserve it. That's where the battle rages. If you lose that struggle, you sin, and the struggle's over, you see. You've been defeated and taken captive. The second struggle is with the guilt you feel for failing to resist the temptation resulting in the sin that you hate so much. The struggle you face is not technically with sin, but with temptation on the front end and the guilt you feel when you fail. Every sin is preceded by temptation, and every temptation can be defeated with the Lord's help. So it just makes sense that if you do not succumb to the temptation, you will not sin, right? In addition to being our Lord and Savior, Jesus is also our high priest and advocate. He's able to come to our rescue when we are facing temptation to sin because he has faced those same temptations. In Hebrews 2.18, says, Because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. In Hebrews 4.15, For we, have not, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that time of need is in the middle of the battle with temptation. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. And that way of escape is going to Jesus, our high priest and advocate, 
who provides grace and mercy in the time of need. That way of escape is always there. God always provides it. You see, sin is still a problem for us, even as believers. But it no longer enslaves us. Sin is possible, even um, probable, but it's not inevitable for a Christian. See, before we were born again, we had both the desire and the ability to sin. We were sinners by nature and by choice. But after believing in Jesus, even though we still have the ability to sin, the desire to sin is progressively expelled by a more powerful desire to be holy. We are no longer sinners by nature. And we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus as our high priest at our disposal to enable us to defeat temptation and to avoid sin. No one can say, I do not sin. No one can say, I cannot sin. But as a Christian, you can say, I will not sin. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you have not only told us that you have freed us from sin, but you have also given us the ability to defeat temptation. Pray, Father, that we would walk in the truth that you have provided for us in your word. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.